Um, I would like now uh, to call up Richard Flegel, who is going to give the Debar Torah tonight. Thank you very much. Sure. Here you go. Thank you. Now, I was just about to start it in precisely the same way, <laughs> because the Torah portion this week gives us the rules of ancient Hebrew real estate and also indentured <laughs> servitude. By the bear Adonai, on Moshe, Behar, Sinai, Lemur, God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai to say, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you enter the land that I assign to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of Adonai. Now I think the attribution to Sinai is important because it's meant to assure us that these words come directly from God in the holiest moment of our conversation, so they're not to be ignored or reinterpreted. So what follows must be really important. So what does God tell us to do? Well, the first thing God tells us is that the land should be treated as we are. That is, in the seventh year it rests, just as we rest on the seventh day. We can't work the land, but we can eat from it directly whatever it produces on its own. And after seven cycles of seven years, we have to celebrate a 50th year of complete redemption. All debts are forgiven, all lands return to their original owners, and all indentured servitude ends. <coughs> now, um, this calculation is also, it's not individual, it's public, so that everybody knows how many years remain on the calendar until the 50th Jubilee year. With that in mind, all the transactions have to be calculated so that the price of a parcel of land or an indentured servant goes down as you get closer to the Jubilee year because the land will have to be returned to itself, the servant will have to be freed, and you'll have that much less use of both of them. So God explains all this, and he also explains the reasoning behind this commandment. And God says, the land must not be sold beyond reclaim, for the land is mine. You are but strangers, resident with me. Throughout the land that you hold, you must provide for the redemption of the land. Now this, I think, is the key to the portion. It's the idea that lifts it from a recitation of ancient real estate law to a moral principle. It gives us something to think about, and it also gives me something to talk about right now. <laughs> So God, or well, the author of this text, speaking for God, recognized that people will fall on hard times and they will be forced to sell their family's land and perhaps even themselves into labor. But those necessities should not ultimately determine a person's whole life or the future of the whole family. Built into these laws governing what can be bought and sold for how much and for how long is not merely the possibility of rede redemption, but the idea that redemption itself is ordained straight from God. A family forced to sell the land will eventually recover it. A Hebrew forced to sell himself into indentured servitude will also eventually be freed, not due to the kindness of the landowner, for example, but because the land belongs ultimately to God, who is only lending it to us. And we cannot own one another at least not forever. Unless, of course, we're from some other tribe, in which case all bets are off. <laughs> but still, looking past the tribalism of the ancient law, what we find is a respect for our environment and also for one another. It's a kind of respect we have not yet written into our own code of law all these years later. Uh, yeah, we all might face dire straits that force us to make compromises, but in this case, redemption will come sooner or later. We must treat our dependents decently, even our servants, because they're ours only by extension and only temporarily. It changes the relationship we have to the land and to the people who are working for us. Now this redemption, and I'm thinking maybe forgiveness is a better word, because it suggests that we shouldn't hold a grudge forever either, that even that should be forgiven. But this redemption does not have to be earned by the people who lose their land and liberty. It's not something they need to earn. And uh, because of that, it reminds me of an exchange in a poem by Robert Frost called Death of the Hired Hand. Uh, when a farmer and his wife are discussing an old farmhand who's returned to that place after many years. She, the wife, understands that the old man has come home to die. 
And her husband says ruefully, quote, home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. But his wife, who is more sympathetic, so they should have said, it's something you somehow haven't to deserve. That is, you don't need to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. It just comes. And I think that seems to me very close to what God has in mind in this Parsha. It's said on Sinai. Remember, what he says is, it's the land that I assigned to you. He's talking about home. It's the home he's about to give to the Hebrews. And he says, look, he understands that we, the Hebrews may lose their way, their family's land, even their personal freedom, but they will get another chance to start again, whether or not they've earned one. It comes with the territory, quite literally. It comes with the territory. Now, that home that he assigns, remember, is still a place that will take us in if we have to go there. We don't have to earn it or deserve it either. In this Parsha, God is telling Moses how that home should be managed, both for, his, for the tribes who are there and also for their descendants, meaning for us. So these instructions include some very particular considerations. So for example, they, there's special conditions for the apartments in the city, which even at that time were treated differently than private homes. And there's also kind of arrangements made for the Levites who were not given ancestral lands. But the central idea of this portion, I think, is very clear if we think about what's being said. Uh, what's happened here is that these laws essentially ordain a vision of a society that is more just than the one in Egypt from which they've just come. These laws they do, they were not intended to prevent, for example, the accumulation of uh, wealth, only obscene wealth, that is, that lopsided distribution of resources with which we are so familiar in our own society. Just imagine for a moment if we adopted these principles here. So let's say Facebook and Amazon had to give back the companies that they bought <laughs> just to kill the competition. Right? What would happen? Well, what would happen is we would live in a far more equitable world than we have today, one that we envy on Instagram because of the world the, the unlimited nature in which we allow people to, to, to take over and, and kill, if they choose, things that they acquire. The text reads, uh, if your kin under you continue in straits and must be given over to you, do not subject them to the treatment of a slave. Remaining with you as a bound laborer, they shall serve with you only until the jet jubilee year. Then they, along with any children, shall be free of your authority. They shall go back to their family and return to their ancestral holding. And this is why. For they are my servants, who I freed from the land of Egypt. They may not give themselves over to servitude. You shall not rule over them ruthlessly. You shall fear your God. So the notion that, in fact, we and our land, the things we own, in, in fact, all belong to God. And he's lending them to us for our use while we're here is intended to change our idea about our relationship to the environment and also our relationship to one another in the social hierarchies that emerge in society. We're not permitted to give ourselves away or the promises that are made to our families. We're not permitted to keep the land we've acquired from those in financial difficulty. And we're not permitted to keep their services forever. Now, this, of course, was intended for the Hebrews. But if we all manage to extend this idea to the rest of humankind, we would be, see a jubilee year that we could all celebrate you know, with or without those uh, flaming uh, cherries. So that's my take. Thank you, Richard. That was lovely. Sure.